Well, welcome to the Oregon Historical Society. My name's Eliza Canty-Jones. I'm so pleased you could join us this evening. I want to formally recognize that we are here on indigenous land. This place is the ancestral and contemporary home of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, and Watlala Band of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. Here at the Oregon Historical Society, our mission is to preserve our state's history and make it accessible to everyone in ways that advance knowledge and inspire curiosity about all the peoples, places, and events that have shaped our state. Am I speaking slowly enough? No. <laughs> She's going to have me trained up by the time we do a few more of these. <laughs> but I do want to let folks know, as you can see, uh, we have Elizabeth here this evening who is going to be captioning the program to help make sure that everyone has access to it. And just as a reminder, if there are things that the Oregon Historical Society can do to make our work more accessible to you or your community, please don't hesitate to let us know and we'll do our best to accommodate. We have a lot of programs here at OHS, our online resources, the Oregon History Project and the Oregon Encyclopedia are authoritative, wonderful sources for all things Oregon history and culture. Our journal, the Oregon Historical Quarterly, is currently in its 120th year of being published by OHS. We have public programs here and around the state, a research library that's open to the public at no charge, no appointment necessary, just come in during open hours and have an idea of something that you want to research. And of course, our museum here in downtown Portland. We are so pleased because in the middle of February, we opened our brand new core exhibit, Experience Oregon. Yay! <laughs> and so we are now back to three full floors of museum exhibits here at OHS all the time. We really appreciate all of the folks who make our work possible. The OHS members and volunteers who are in the audience tonight, thank you, thank you, thank you. We have many individual and corporate and foundation sponsors of a wide variety of our work. Uh, the public supports us, often through the state of Oregon, and also Multnomah County residents, thank you for voting twice to enact a modest property tax levy to support us and four historical societies in East Multnomah County. We say thank you with free admission to the museum all the time and discounts on membership. So make sure that you take advantage of that, and thanks again, Multnomah County. So tonight's program is offered in honor of our new exhibit, Experience Oregon, uh, which is really um, a major undertaking of the Historical Society and our attempt to tell the history of a place as big and grand and old and complicated as Oregon in just 7,000 square feet. So there is a lot to see in the exhibit. How many have visited already? Yay. Thank you. And how many think you've seen everything and you don't need to go back? <laughs> but that's what I thought. <laughs> so tonight's program and many others in our series uh, are really an, an opportunity for all of us to deepen our understanding of some of the content that's in our exhibit, have the opportunity to hear from the most amazing scholars and knowledge holders of Oregon history, um, and have an opportunity to ask them questions. So we're really pleased to have our two speakers tonight. I'll do a little introduction, then they're each going to speak, and then they're going to join each other on the stage here and be looking for questions from all of you um, and really have a, a conversation and want to know what else you want to know about. So our first speaker will be Bobby Connor, who's the director of Tomaslik Cultural Institute which is a 45,000 square foot tribally owned museum on the Umatilla Reservation near Pendleton, Oregon. It opened in 1998. The institute serves three goals, to accurately present the Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla people's history. Those are the three tribes that comprise the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. To perpetuate knowledge of their history and culture and to contribute to the tribal economy. Bobby is Cayuse, Umatilla, and Nez Perce, and is enrolled at Confederated Tribes of Umatilla. She is a graduate of Pendleton High School, the University of Oregon, and Willamette University's Atkinson Graduate School of Management. She serves on the Eastern Oregon University Board of Trustees, the EcoTrust and Oregon Community Foundation Boards of Directors, and most importantly, the Oregon Historical Society Board of Trustees. 
We're also pleased to have with us Bill Lang, who is Emeritus Professor of History at Portland State University and author of many, many books and articles on Pacific Northwest and Oregon history, including in 2004 with Carl Abbott, Two Centuries of Lewis and Clark. He was also guest editor of the Oregon Historical Quarterly's Fall 2004 special issue on Lewis and Clark. So please join me in welcoming Bobby Connor and Bill Lang. Good evening. My Indian name is Sasawipum, and Sasawipum is a name my grandmother gave me when I was 13 in her bedroom, and then we paid for it in public ceremony when I was 28 after I finished graduate school. Um, this could be, we're not certain, my grandmother in this image who gave me that name. She was the youngest of 13 pregnancies my great-grandmother had, and only two of those babies lived to adulthood, and only my grandmother had children. So this could be, that could be her, but we don't know because I don't know which year Major Morehouse took this photograph. <laughs> so we're going to explore tonight a little bit of what you get to be exposed to in the Experience Oregon exhibit, but we're going to do it from a Confederated Tribes of Umatilla point of view. I do not want you to think that I am representing all nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon. Um, I am not representing all American Indians of the United States. <laughs> and in particular, what I want you to have a sense of is a tribal person's sense of a tribal history that is a part of Oregon and see how that fits uh, for what you know about tribes with whom you are familiar. So as we advance, this is um, the area that you, you can recognize the state lines here. This is the area that our people historically lived and traveled in. It is not the same expanse as the Umatilla Reservation. It's much larger. So minimally, we lived and traveled in about 12 million acres, and this map represents um, a much larger expanse of land, so it takes us into the Bitterroot Salish, the Crow Country, uh, the Buffalo Country that's now called Yellowstone, takes us uh, as far south as Fort Sutter in Sacramento and up into the Fraser River of British Columbia. We have this important notion that not only did the bear go over the mountain to see what was on the other side, so did we. Uh, Lewis and Clark were not actually the first explorers on this landscape. Tribal people uh, explored their neighbors and their homelands uh, long before uh, Lewis and Clark arrived. And the reason I want to give you this sort of sense of uh, this awareness is that our knowledge is very intimate with our immediate vicinity homeland, but we have native place names in many, many tribes across the United States for places that are very distant. So the name for Salilo, Wayam, the name for the trails through the mountains, the names of the places as far away as Yellowstone, um, those names are part of the database of our knowledge of ecosystems. And we don't want you to think that it was restricted that the contemporary reservation today is what we call home. Now, there's a particular reason I care about this. I do not want the children who come after me, the successive generations, to think that the reservation is home any more that you would want your descendants to think that your neighborhood is home. The vast expanse of our homeland is home, and we need to be knowledgeable of more than our neighborhood in order to understand the universe in which we live. So the fish that come home to spawn in our tributaries on the main stem Columbia have traveled thousands of miles over three, four, five years around the Pacific Rim and back to our tables. They have knowledge of the world. They are well-traveled fish, unless they're farm fish. We don't want our children to be like buffalo born behind a fence or salmon that were raised in ponds. 
We want our people to understand their universe. So this is one of the reasons we want people to know our range of knowledge. This is what we consider more of our aboriginal domain. This is our homeland. And the reason I'm talking about this is because as we start to talk about newcomers coming into the homeland, this is the place that was sort of within our control, our jurisdiction, our dominion. And the notion that we were, this is still a much larger land base than the Umatilla Reservation consists of today. And so you see down in Ontario, um, the brown sort of data density that occurs in this map. My grandmother, who was born in 1889, or 1899, was still traveling with her family in about three years before the Pendleton Roundup began in 1910, by horseback according to the seasonal rounds that our people followed to gather foods from spring until fall. And we... Uh, were not, our family, her family, was not at the earliest roundups because we were still fishing for salmon in the Payette Weezer area of the Snake River. Now, it's not that good a salmon fishing there anymore <laughs> for a variety of reasons, but that's where, that was part of the seasonal round in September that would deliver them back home typically in October with 12 to 20 pack horses of foods that they had been gathering since April. You see that this homeland extends up into the Yakima River. It goes up the Columbia, and it is extending up into what's considered Palouse and Nez Perce country. These, we would suggest to you, were not exclusive homelands. These are joint use, usual and accustomed. These are areas that we may have shared with other tribes with whom we were closely intermarried, we have been intermarried amongst the people up and down the Columbia River for many, 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 many generations before Lewis and Clark hit the ground here. And the reason is our tribal laws require it. We cannot marry in our culture closer than a fourth or fifth cousin, unlike the English chief factors who went home to England and married their first cousins. So we have to marry either upriver or downriver because it's not appropriate to marry within basically the unit that you within your sort of kinship system that's immediate. When you look at this data density map, you can see that there's darker and lighter areas, and really all that reflects is the present day knowledge we have. So this is an insufficient or inadequate representation of the database that my great grandfather and my great grandmothers had. This is the database of knowledge from my grandfather's time forward because my grandfather was instrumental in recording some of this knowledge on behalf of our people. So this represents data density of pl native place names and ecosystem knowledge. It doesn't represent all of the knowledge, just some of the knowledge that's available to us today. This is more colorful, and what it represents are the three tribes that are part of the Confederacy of Umatilla, the Cayuse, the Umatilla, and the Walla Walla. So the bright yellow, or canary, is sort of notion of exclusive domain of Cayuse, or primary domain. The bright pink is Umatilla, or Imatellum. And then the blue is the Walla Walla. But what you see is more of that dark black, sort of where the Venn diagram shows all. That's because we lived in harmony, for the most part, with our neighbors who were, uh, for the most part, speaking similar languages, except for the Cayuse, which was a language isolate. So if my grandmother, who spoke Columbia River Sahaptan, could speak to people from Warm Springs and from Yakima and Walla Walla and from uh, Palouse backgrounds, the same way my grandfather, who spoke Nez Perce, could understand those other languages or dialects. They didn't usually speak to each other in the tribal language unless they were trying to keep things from the kids or grandkids. <laughs> so this map shows you, and you see the subset map where the area that it's representing, shows you that we shared a lot. It was collective use of these prominent sort of dense areas. And the knowledge is densest there. And part of what it also shows 
is that the data density is greater in the diminished land area of the reservation. So our knowledge has become concentrated to that small plot of land that is the reservation or the stronghold around and near the reservation. Not what we would prefer, but it's certainly what the case has become. So it's a reflection of changes in the knowledge and the density of the data about those place names and uses. And these are the Blue Mountains. These are my wonderful, fabulous, welcome home Blue Mountains with some snow, which of course is even best. That's the, we had, uh, in some places, 270% of our usual snowpack, and then we had really good floods. <laughs> the reason I show you this is because this is the country that the pioneers came through. Now, Lewis and Clark came through the mountains, but not these mountains. Lewis and Clark came into our country from uh, the Lolo Pass, escorted down by Nez Perce men, two of them, who were quite prominent and related to Cayuse people. They came through our country, they spent a little time, they came to the coast, they wanted to catch a ship, they missed the ship, they came back through our country. Both times they came through, they were in a hurry, they spent a little time, they made some recordings. Most of what they recorded is fairly accurate to what their knowledge and perceptions were, um, not always accurate from our point of view. But they were astute, capable men of their time, and they made observations that were important records. Most importantly, what Lewis and Clark did was put us on the map. That's good news and bad news, depending on which side of the story you're on. So putting us on the map, putting the Columbia River above the narrows near the Dalles or Grand Dalles or Dallesport, mapping that area that you couldn't navigate past between the bitter roots and the Narrows, mapping that was like opening up our neighborhood for sale. And the reason is we were lucky. As Native peoples, we had been protected by geography and topography. Vancouver couldn't get above the Narrows. Most people who came over the mountains, even on the Saskatchewan River, didn't drop down until after Lewis and Clark into our neighborhood. So David Thompson, the Snake River Brigades come after, <clears throat> Northwest Company comes, the Hudson's Bay Company then comes in as, and takes over. But we were kind of left alone, and it's only been 200, really, this is kind of amazing to me, it's only been 214 years since Lewis and Clark hit, made footprints in our homeland. That's really recently. And if my grandmother 100 years ago, 120 years ago, was still riding in the seasonal round, that tells you that we're really only six or seven generations in my family from that story of Lewis and Clark coming to town. Lewis and Clark are a big deal in the sense that they're novel and people are really curious about them. But there was a more important thing that happened right before Lewis and Clark came about 100 years, and that was the acquisition of the horse. The horse was a tremendous technological change in our lives. That was more important than Lewis and Clark at the time. After the fur companies come, after the missionaries come, then comes the Oregon Trail. And they come, many of them, or most of them, through these Blue Mountains. And the diaries tell you of the good news and the bad news that the Blue Mountains bring. Good news, fresh water, heavily timbered. Bad news, heavily timbered and rocky. <laughs> Not good wagon tra trail travel. Um, good news is that the Indians are friendly and usually helpful to almost all of the wagons. All of our oral histories say that the people coming on those wagon trains arrived pitiful. The oral histories of our people tell you that when Lewis and Clark came, the sort of prevailing sentiment was, we just hoped they'd get back where they belonged because they were living fairly precariously in our country. They bought dogs from us to eat when we were bringing in thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of um, uh, fish during spawning season. But because the fish were dying in the river, as they do after they've spawned, they thought the fish might be poisoned. 
So they didn't eat raw fish or cooked fish. They didn't want any of that fish. They bought dogs from us instead to consume, which makes you wonder who's calling who heathens. <laughs> but we were rich in dogs before we were rich in horses, and we were also rich in salmon. So when the Oregon Trail comes through, our people are not like Hollywood. We are pretty receptive, especially the people who were friends with Marcus and Narcissa Whitman, who were agents of national expansion for the United States. The American Protestants represented the United States, and the Hudson's Bay fur trappers and the Oblate Jesuits typically represented the Canadian or mother country interest. We were just party to that competition by being present but no one was talking to us about the international competition for our land. When you think about the fact that we, shortly after, a very short number of years, 15, 12, 15 years after the arrival of the early trains, um, really only 21 years after Jason Lee first camps in our neighborhood, we are ceding 92% of our homeland through, through a treaty council. The most important thought about that treaty council is that no one in the United States would have had to sit down and do business with us as a nation if we didn't have jurisdiction and control of our homeland. Some back to the 1400s, the international law said you could dispossess native peoples of their lands by one of two ways, conquest or treaty. They made a treaty with us to dispossess of uh, dispossess us of our lands. That was in 1855. It was ratified after Oregon proclaimed its statehood. A few weeks. And it's important to note this because the Treaty Council was an acknowledgement, a legal recognition of our status of people in control of a domain. And they were negotiating to dispossess us of that land. My, in my mind, that's phenomenal. Lewis and Clark, 1805, 50 years later, 92% of our homeland being awarded to the United States through a treaty council that's largely conducted under duress. That is not a pretty story. But as our elders tell us, there's good and bad with everything. We didn't want a treaty, but because of the treaty, we have a reserved homeland that is a subset of our original homeland, called the reservation. The American experiment to assimilate and civilize us did not intend for the reservation to become a cultural stronghold. It was supposed to be a holding pen until we were mainstreamed into the rest of the society. But indeed, it became a cultural stronghold, where we have many denominations and faiths practiced, including our own traditional law and traditional faith. So there's good and bad with every story. Getting put on the map by Lewis and Clark, good and bad. The things we got from trappers and traders, good and bad. The things we traded for with the pioneers, good and bad. We didn't expect to get diseases. We loved the goods they had. It was like today, you want the coolest phone. They did things that we were fascinated by, and they had things that were novel and unique and were amazing. And in my family oral history, all of our stories about the pioneers were very entertaining for me as a child. So they came with kittens, kitties, pits, pits, pit, pitis. There's lots of in Indian words that are mimicking the kitten word in English. But we had lynx, bobcat, mountain lion. You didn't hold them on your lap. So my grandmother, when she was making that seasonal round as a child, had a cat they called Muzzer that rolled her mother's Victrola when it played Caruso. And it also rode in a bag around the saddle horn when they went on our seasonal round. I don't know if they were the only Indian family with a cat on the saddle when they went on the seasonal round, but the cat went. They made moccasins or rawhide shoes for the dogs when they got into the Snake River Shale country so they could travel that way. And the pioneers had chickens. And chickens are unlike, and domestic chickens were unlike anything we had. And people came from miles around to see them peck at each other and go in and out. Because a guy followed the pioneers down here to the valley 
and came home with a gunny sack full of chickens. And people came from everywhere to see those chickens. Um, they also, according to my great-grandfather, danced to music that sounded like big cats wailing. <laughs> so that would be fiddles. And they danced like they had blocks or cans on their feet. That would be clogging or jigging. Um, and so all of our oral histories were about the peculiar things the pioneers brought. One of the most peculiar things they had were oxen. If you've never seen one in your life before and you meet one, it is an odd kind of being. And they don't move fast and they're not really agile and they're not really very cooperative sometimes. So why you'd prefer those over horses was kind of a mystery. But they were interesting. Our early relationship with Lewis and Clark, with the trappers and traders, with the missionaries, and with the immigrants that came through our country was largely friendly and useful for both us and for them, and we provided utility and economy for them as they came into our homeland. The story changes by the time we kill the Whitmans in 1847, and that's a chapter for another talk. Thank you. Everybody, everybody getting a good dose of the real history, <laughs> not just the stuff that you read or were taught in school. When Eliza asked me to join Bobby and have this presentation tonight as part, can you hear it? Oh, sorry. Thank you. When Eliza asked me to uh, join Bobby and give this talk tonight as a compliment to the great exhibit that opened on the 14th of last month, or two months now. Um, I thought, really? We're going to do Lewis and Clark and the Oregon Trail, and I have 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, anyway, I thought, well, I know that Bobby can do that sort of thing, but I'm not sure that um, a former professor of history is a good person to give that task because I'd have to start with the 10th Crusade. Uh, so, thinking about it, I thought, well, maybe environmental. That's a, that's a good way to approach it. And Bobby's given us a great lesson in the environmental by showing you the Blue Mountains. In fact, that's part of what we would say about the Oregon Trail, the Blue Mountains, and of course, Laurel Hill. And Lewis and Clark, the Columbia, a river they learned to detest. Anybody who's read the Lewis and Clark journals know that as they descended the main stem of the Columbia after they battled their way down the snake, rapid after rapid after rapid, by the time they got to the Long Narrows and Celilo and Cascades, they were pretty sick of the Columbia and disparaging of the people on the Columbia as it turned out. But we'll get to that in a little bit. So I thought, well, could talk about that, but that's not really what I want to talk about because what I want to do is connect us to the exhibit. In fact, almost any exhibit. Aha, he's there. Good. And so that reminded me that we should be talking about the exhibit, and what popped into my head was Charles Wilson Peel. Now, we'll come back to him later, but you probably, anybody know Charles Wilson Peel? Anybody ever heard of him? Yeah, one or two. He was a Maryland-born artist who created America's really first great museum in Philadelphia after the revolution where he 
moved and lived out the rest of his life. He doesn't die until 1827. And this is a self-portrait of Peel that he painted in 1822, five years before he died. And what he is showing you is his welcoming and curious way of opening the door to his second floor museum of natural history. And if you look closely on the foreground of the painting, you'll see a femur from uh, a mammoth. You'll see a fossilized turtle and other things. Anyway, this was a museum of curiosities. And this is important, I think, for us to think about with respect to the exhibit and any exhibit because what he's doing is he's making a point, and a point I want to make here uh, fairly strongly, and I'll come back to it too in a minute, and that is that museums do not educate. Museums are not books. Museums are not classrooms. Museums are not discourse. They're not arguments. Museums do one thing, and it's a big thing, but they do one thing. They provoke you. And when they provoke you, they turn the equation around. Instead of passively, I don't mean that you really are passive, but instead of passively listening to myself or Bobby, the museum turns it around and forces you to be the creator, forces you to be the active thinker. He knew this. So there's not discourse about the fossils. There are the fossils. And the questions that come to your mind are precisely what that museum is trying to do. And it's the same thing that this museum is doing. All of the structure of the museum and all of its objects and all of its methods are really focused on doing that one thing. And that got me to thinking about what is this whole enterprise anyway? Exhibits, historical societies, our interest, and it prompted me to go to my library and pull off the shelf the work of a Polynesian historian by the name of Greg Denning, who wrote a book called Performances. And in this book, which I highly recommend, he makes the point that history, no matter how you think about it, is never distant that the relationship between our time and our thinking and the past, even the very deep past, and Bobby is a perfect example of this, is never unconnected. They are, in fact, one in the same. That history never stops its action, whether you like it or not. It comes back, whether it's your grandparents, whether it's the event in your own life that's 30 years ago and comes back when you're in your 50s or 60s. And these relationships between the depth of the distant past even, the super distant past, or the more recent past, and yourself and how you think is absolutely inescapable. And what Denning says in his book, and I'm not going to go through the philosophical arguments, is a pretty simple proposition, really, when you think about it. He says that the whole thing is presentation, that all history is presentation. All of it is theatrical. And why is it theatrical? It's theatrical because whoever the historian is, is presenting their understanding through their own thinking and their own experience and their own times, 
what this was about. What was Lewis and Clark about? What was the Oregon Trail about? Oregon Trail, my God. 1840 to 1860, hundreds of thousands of people, but the Oregon Trail didn't die. People were bringing their wagons over the Oregon Trail as late as 1912. So nothing is really cut off. There's no gap between us and that past. And what Denning points out is one of the reasons that is operative is because all history that's presented, all historians, everything that you can think about, if you just stop and think about it a little bit, is bound up in paradoxes. These paradoxes are powerful. These paradoxes are impossible. Passion, discipline, natural, artificial. We have every part of all of these paradoxes in our lives and in our past that operate as human beings facing all manner of choices again and again and again. And it's not that we're like Lewis and Clark. It's not that my great-great-great-grandfather, Joel Palmer, who shook hands with Bobby's forebearers, it's not that those people are the same as we are. Of course not. But what he's pointing out is that the paradoxes are absolutely critical to understanding what our lives and their lives were all about. If you don't have both of the sides of the paradox, whatever they might be, you won't get the real History. That's his point. And you can't do that without thinking. You can't do that without being emotional. If you are not connected to your own investment in what the past means, you've got a problem. You're unmoored. The other thing that he says that I think is important in this relation is that in all of his studies of Polynesia, which is a huge, huge study and has perplexing problems, anybody who's studied how language traveled, how people traveled, etc., there are many, many questions that haven't been solved about Polynesia. But one of the things that comes out of those studies, which is very helpful to us, and that's why you ought to be world historians as well as Oregon historians, he says that it really comes down to this. Human beings migrate, and they end up with two kinds of people. And he calls them stranger and native. Stranger and native. The stranger comes and needs a map. William Clark produces that map in 1812, or excuse me, 1810. David Thompson the great explorer of the Canadian West and the Pacific Northwest of the United States, makes his map in 1812. As Bobby pointed out, what happened to the Umatilla, the Cayuse, the Walla Walla, the Nez Perce, was Lewis and Clark put them on the map. The point here is the native doesn't need map is not critical. 
Now that isn't because that person doesn't travel or doesn't go someplace and then might need a map, of course. The whole point of the stranger and the native is to recognize that the communication between those two operate on completely different bases. So if we go back and ask questions, and this is what I want you to do when you go through the exhibit, when you see anything, an object, doesn't make any difference what it is, any presentation, ask yourself the question, what do I need to know about this? What does that make me think about? Respond to it. But in the case of the stranger and the native in Lewis and Clark, and the stranger and the native in the Oregon Trail and the aftermath of the Oregon Trail, which Bobby mentioned, the primary one being the treaties, we have the same thing at play. And here's the interesting thing about this. It never ends. It never stops. In other words, and I don't want to be too dramatic about this, but the stranger and the native conversation is still going on. Not in some negative way, I don't mean it that way, I just mean it's still part of our history. So when Bobby and I can talk about things, we can talk about the stranger-native relationship from 1855 and recognize that it's still part of our present in so many ways, changing all the time. So Lewis and Clark, what were they trying to do? And what did they, in their way as stranger, discover and pursue when they encountered native. At least on the Columbia, and that's what we're talking about, not the way they were on the plains, but at least on the Columbia, as I pointed out earlier, Clark, he's the one who's writing going down the Columbia. Lewis doesn't write going down the Columbia. We don't know why. Some have suggested that there was a lost journal, not likely. Lewis writes a lot going up the Columbia. But Clark, going down the Columbia, he doesn't like what he sees. He thinks the people are unfortunately problematic. He says they got, they're blind. There's too much, too much glare off the water. That's why their eyesight's poor. Their teeth are all ground down because they're eating salmon. It's got sand in the fish and on. It's all kinds of evaluations, even to the point of character. And we could go on and on about that. And we don't know why that really comes upon him when it does, but it does have a distinct coloration on how he presents the Columbia. So, just like Peel, the journals pull back the curtain to show you the curiosities of what Lewis and Clark have found. And in doing that, every one of those relationships that are charted out in the descriptions and sometimes very, very bountiful descriptions of the land, Lewis and Clark are after one thing, primarily. They're after creating a catalog. A catalog of nature. A scientific register of everything that they encounter. Thomas Jefferson's instructions, if any of you have ever read them, are intricate, lengthy, and highly specific. Enough so that just reading them, you're tired, and you haven't done anything. What did they know about the people they encountered? It turns out, 
not very much. And what's really remarkable from my reading, and this is part of that paradox I was talking about, you'll have to search long and hard in the journals to find any description of native spirituality. They had no interest. They had no curiosity. They seemed not to be aware. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard to fathom that. And if you think about that very long, you start to get discouraged. At least I do. Because I wonder about these enlightenment driven explorers and what was important to them. Of course, we don't know, and I'm not going to get into it, and I'm not going to bring him up and put him on the couch. As much as you might like me to do that, I'm not going to do that. But what I will say about it is it's difficult. If as stranger you want something, and as native you're just wondering what in the world is this? Because what we do know about the relationship between the native people on the river and the stranger, in the case of Lewis and Clark, but later the Oregon Trail people and my forebearer, Joel Palmer, is they were still asking that same question. What in the world are you about? Now, we can read a lot into that. If we can ask, is the question, are you spiritual? I've got an example of that in a minute I'm going to read. Secondly, when the Oregon Trail stranger comes, one of the things that's very curious is, just as Lewis and Clark did in a very funny kind of way, the stranger meets, them, meets himself coming toward him. I've been working on Palmer a lot the last couple of years, so this one is right back in the front of my brain. Palmer writes in his journal on his 1845 trip, he says, well, they've come, and where are they? Well, they're someplace between Grand Ron Valley and uh, the Umatilla River. Here they come. They're selling vegetables. They're selling potatoes. They're selling moccasins. We don't have much to trade except our clothes. And some of us have only one suit left. Who are these people? These are the native traders who are growing the potatoes and the vegetables or trading for the vegetables and the potatoes because they know they've got willing customers who are going to pay top dollar. As Palmer says, God, one of the people didn't have any clothes left and had to pay $20 just for a little bit of flour. Now you can see that a dozen different ways, but the point of it is that even at that time, in that space, the relationship between the native people and the stranger turns out to be an analog of the earlier, earlier connection between the stranger and the native. Because what's the number one complaint of Lewis and Clark on the river? They're thieves. They're thieves. They take stuff from us. They riddle in our camps. In fact, Lewis is so upset by it, 
on their way back up the river, which was in haste, by the way, because they couldn't stand another week at Fort Clatsop. Oh, my God. Let us out of this place. Lewis says, you do that again, I'm going to blow your head off. And that's not exactly what he said, but that's the gist of it. He said, I'll kill you. Really? Again, the native looks at the stranger and says, what are you about? You're going to shoot me because I take that piece of iron that clearly you're not using right now? So this is the paradoxes I'm talking about that come up from Denning's analysis. So I've got a couple of, yes, see my time's running. I have a couple of things to read from two incidents. One of them is the Lewis and Clark experience, an incident from the, from the trail, from the expedition. And the other one is from Palmer, and that goes back to uh, the Oregon Trail stranger, so to speak, native connection. So this is a October 19th, 1805. You can find this in volume five of the Lewis and Clark journals published by University of Nebraska Press if you want to go look this up and read a bit more about it. Clark is coming down the river. It's between the John Day and the Umatilla. The precise location is not really easy to determine. He has a gun. He shoots a crane on the wing out of the air. The bird lands, he gets it, he comes down the river and encounters five uh, tents, habitations, and 32 people, older men, women and children. The younger men are off doing what they were doing in October of 1805. So from the journal, men, women, and a few children sitting promiscuously in that that's an odd terminology for somebody in a tent, but nonetheless, in the greatest agitation, some crying and wringing their hands, others hanging their heads. I gave my hand to them and made signs of my friendly disposition and offered the men my pipe to smoke and distributed a few small articles which I had in my pockets. Interesting. Reuben Gold Thwaites, who published the first full version of the journals, which turned out not to be so full, but nonetheless the first one in 1914 was able through research to figure out, well, they were afraid because they couldn't figure out how anybody could knock a bird out of the air with that stick. The stranger, the native. The Waits, professor at University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, I think mistook what was going on pretty fundamentally. And this is particularly true when you read the next thing. Because Lewis and Clark had two ongoing primary descriptions of travel. The journals, what happened, and the course and distances. And in the course and distances, but not in the journal, because the journal was written later. Here's what Clark wrote on October 19th, 1805. I went on shore, so that's after he's knocked down the bird, landed at the first five lodges, found the Indians much frightened, all got into their lodges and crying. I took all by the hand, I gave a string of wampum to the principal man. We dined on dried salmon and set out. And then he adds this. I am confident that I could have tomahawked every Indian here. The 
First, why would he write such a thing? And second, why didn't he put it in the journal? Passion, discipline. Let's go fast forward, 1845. This is from Palmer's journal in the Grand Ronde Valley. An incident quite worthy of note occurred at this place. The chief, Aliquot, he calls him, but that wasn't his actual name, who had joined us at our encampment and had pursued this day's journey in company, had pitched his tent some 300 yards to the rear of our camp. In the evening, in strolling about the camp, I came near his tent and entered with the intention of enjoying his squaw, employing his squaw in the soling of my moccasins. While she was engaged in this employment, a conversation had sprung up between the old chief and myself. Now I have to pause here and say he could speak English. And why was that? Because he'd had quite a bit of interaction with the missionaries. In which he took occasion to ask me if I were a Christian, as also whether there were many Christians upon the road, to which questions I, of course, answered in the affirmative, supposing that he merely wished to know whether I class myself with the heathen or Christians. On my return to camp, some of our party proposed that we should while away an hour or so in a game of cards, which was readily assented to. We had but engaged in our amusement when the old chief, Aliquot, made his appearance, holding a small stick in his hand. He stood transfixed for a moment and then advanced to me, raising his hand, which held the stick in an act of chastising me and gently taking me by the arm and said, Captain, Captain, no good, no good. You may guess my astonishment at being lectured by someone wild and untutored 2,500 miles from a civilized land. I inwardly resolved to abandon card playing forever. <laughs> Paradoxes. Where's the person in these examples? Where's the person in Clark? Where's the person in Palmer? Where's the person in Aliquot? Where's the person in the 32 people in the five lodges along the That's what historians have to deal with. In short, pay attention to the paradoxes. Thank you. Who's ready to ask a question? Before you do that, I'm really glad you brought up the crane. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when, when, I, when I read that, journal entry, not journal entry, but that map entry that he could have tomahawked them all. It always reminds me that all along the Lewis and Clark Trail from Monticello, where we kicked off the bicentennial in 2003 to the closing in St. Louis in 2006, the one question that kids would ask but adults wouldn't ask is why didn't you guys kill them? And it's a reasonable, legitimate, appropriate question. But kids were the only ones who were brave enough to ask. <clears throat> and in our case, I would say to you, the reason we were helpful to Lewis and Clark and the Oregon Trail Travelers was not only curiosity, but because 
we were given in our homeland a tremendous amount of abundance. We had hard times. We had difficult times. But it was the expectation in our spiritual teaching, back to spirituality, that we're supposed to take care of people who were less well off than us. And it was pretty clear all of the people, Lewis and Clark and their men, and the travelers on the Oregon Trail were less well off than we were. And they were, as I mentioned earlier, sort of regarded as in a pitiful state. The children's shoes were worn out. They often made moccasins for them. Um, they were usually out of munitions and left their families in the Blue Mountains or on the Umatilla River so they could get supplies at the Whitman Mission to keep going. Um, they couldn't hunt if they had no munitions. So it was a very interesting question that I thought that children had the good sense to ask, um, and we had not prepared public answers for that because no one else asked it. But the, fa the fact of the matter is there was really no reason to kill them. What threat did 33, 32 men and one woman represent to us? We clearly outnumbered them. We outnumbered the men at the Treaty Council. We outnumbered the, we were still outnumbering people well into the late years of the Oregon Trail. The real issue is what cost would killing them come? What, what would cost, what would it cost us if we killed them? And that's a question that we'll never quite know the answer to. Was it, would it have been too high a price? Because we're pretty confident it would have been the end of us if we had ended them, eventually. The other thing that I thought was really fantastic that you brought up, Bill, and I want to comment on is the notion of the Indians being thieves. Lewis and Clark have this really cool thing. So it's, I always liken it to a guy dating three women. So they call the, Umata the Walla Wallas the most honest, sincere, and hospitable people they've met. They also say that about the Nez Perce and the Bitterroot Salish. So, you know, they're free with those compliments to at least three native groups. But the reason they say that is because in near Dayton, Washington, where Walla Walla men follow them and catch up with the expedition to return the steel traps that the expedition has left behind, that's why they pay the compliment to the Walla Wallas, that they're honest, sincere, and hospitable. Because we returned what would have made a lot of trade metal points. Those traps could have been converted to a lot of trade metal goods. We returned them to them, and in the journal it notes, traps that the men had carelessly left behind. Now when they're calling all those other Indians from the Teton Sioux to the Chinooks on the Columbia River below the Dalles, thieves, they're calling them thieves because they have possession of goods that used to belong to the core. On their way back, they publicly flog one of the members of the expedition for gambling with the Indians. He's trying to fulfill their need for a canoe. He knows better than the captains do that one of the ways you get goods from an Indian is to gamble. Because we gamble for things, we trade for things, and we gift things. That's how we redistribute wealth in our tribe. Those three methods. And gambling was just as legitimate as trading, but they publicly flog a man for gambling to try and get what they needed. That's because we're all thieves, whether they left things behind or not. You know, one of the points that Bobby's bringing up about this that, again, connects that past uh, so thoroughly with what preceded and what followed is that uh, during the treaty negotiations and after when the treaty stipulations were being pursued by the superintendent of Indian Affairs and the Indian agents and also being watched very carefully by the volunteer armies, militias in uh, the Northwest. These are not trained soldiers, but uh, individuals who are going to protect against Indian depredations. But one of the things that's consistently pushed by and this is important, I think, to think about by the most 
protective of white officials in relationships with native people is whatever you do, this is an agent or anybody who's part of the white community, whatever you do, do not ever take advantage of native people. They don't understand as much as you do. Don't be immoral around native people. And they were oftentimes identified as reckless and wicked. Now what this does is it again brings up this point I made about paradoxes. It's where are these people? Who is it that as we look back we say, that's my hero right there. Well maybe and maybe not. Think about it. Ask the question, what does that really mean? How does that work? How does it work today? What happens to you today, and I don't mean that you're the same as they are, when you have that patronizing assumption before you've done anything? And this went on and continued to go on, and it is part of a deeper history, but it's also part of this, this what would we call it, really? Ongoing exchange of people getting to know other people, whether they're as many or not as many, and suddenly, of course, for other reasons we haven't talked about, the native population in the Northwest finds itself at a huge disadvantage to the invading stranger population, and really it's impossible. Let's get some questions. We're gonna, you, you let us, we will continue to rattle on here. Will you all um, say uh, quickly what the meeting was between your ancestors? You alluded to it. So, so in 1855, Joel Palmer, Bill's ancestor, represented the Oregon Superintendency um, in the Treaty Council at Walla Walla with the Cayuse, Umatilla, Walla Walla, Nez Perces, and Yakimas, as well as a sprinkling of Coeur d'Alene, Spokane's, Okanagan's, and others. Palooses. Oh, and Palooses, yes. Yep. And my ancestors who were there with Bill's ancestor were um, an old chief by the name of Estikas, who was Cayuse, who um, in some of the journals, uh, Farnham journals, called him Old Cricky because they can't say his Indian name. And... Um, Old Joseph, or Tawitakis, uh, was present, as was Chief Timothy, or Timutsu. We found this out several years ago when we first got together and met each other. This is when, Je uh, when, when Bobby came back to take on the task of being the executive director at Temuscalic um, on the reservation. And we said, oh my God! <laughs> They knew each other. <laughs> All right, who's ready? Thank you very much for a very informative presentation. Um, I just want to ask a question regarding um, this kind of sparked a memory, uh, some of the stuff that my great, 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 great uh, grandfather McMinn Dotson wrote in his letters home after he came on the Oregon Trail in 1853, and he wrote um, regarding his time in this area, there could be a fine settlement made upon Powder River and in the Grand Ronde Valley if it were permitted, but this country belongs to the Cayuse Indians who are very friendly and quite an intelligent tribe. And I was just wondering if you could speak maybe perhaps on the, the subtext um, that you would know regarding that quote. Well, certainly the year 1853 is important because nobody, um, nobody characterized the Cayuse as friendly or kind or hospitable after we killed Dr. Whitman, Narcissa, and 11 other men or young men in 1847. So those are generous words spoken from somebody new to the area <laughs> who hasn't heard our reputation yet. 
um, I would say to you, it's, it's fascinating to me because I was just, for another project I'm working on, I was just reading uh, General Howard's account from the 1880s of the 1877 war where he is intoning the lack of virtue in young Chief Joseph because he has a Cayuse ancestor. Can't blame it on his Nez Perseness. <laughs> Um, he's a bad guy, he's got some bad inklings and probably disreputable notions because he is related to these murdering Cayuses. And that's still going on in 1877. It's being penned in 1880 press materials by Howard. And so I'm fascinated with that entry and want to know more about it because, first of all, we, um, we are very fond of that area from the Powder River up in, from Baker City all the way into the Grand Ronde Valley. It was fabulous grazing land. Um, I have bought hay from the Powder River Valley that was from land that had never been tilled. The best beautiful, most beautiful Timothy grass hay I've ever purchased from anybody. The guy's out of, out of business now. But that Powder River country and that up into the Grand Ronde Valley was some of the best grazing land for our horses you could possibly have. And the only disruption there is if the Paiutes, Northern Paiutes or the Bannocks from the south decided to raid into that territory and raid our people, um, our camps there. So uh, we were at the Treaty Council in 1855, two years after that entry. Two different headmen, including Young Chief, talk about wanting our homeland, our reserved lands, the reservation, to include the Grand Ronde Valley because of its abundance and lushness for salmon, for roots, and all of the things that sustain our people. And it's one of the greatest heartbreaks in the reservation that we ended up with um, because of a lot of surveying shenanigans and other things that we lost the Grand Ronde Valley from our homeland. That's, that was a huge part of our loss. Another uh, aspect of what, that, uh, what, what you read, 1853, not only was the 55 treaty not finished, but the other treaties that were negotiated beginning as early as 1851, so two years before, but never ratified, is the requirement which was bound into congressional legislation in 1850, which required the relinquishment through session of land in the Oregon country, and specifically in Oregon territory, 1848, of course, before any title to land could be legal. So part of the reference isn't necessarily a reference to anything that was said to the individual, to your forebearer, but rather the knowledge that here's this wonderful place, but I can't, I can't claim it until Indian title is cleared. Why did they do that? The Congress had before avoided doing this, but were pressured into it, and one of the reasons for doing that was that that 1850 law was so uh, <laughs> egregiously liberal, to put it mildly, to give people upwards of a full section of land just for parking on it and doing a few improvements is pretty shocking. So in order to get that passed through Congress, one of the things that had to be done was to deal with Indian title. Uh, there were nefarious reasons on the part of the congressional arguments against it, um, which have nothing to do with defending Indian rights to property, but a completely different political maneuver, sort of like today. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, 
Baba, you mentioned that 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 treaty was signed by the native people. Uh, they felt they were under duress. Would you characterize that a little bit more? And also, the the native head men that were signing these treaties seemed like a slug of them. Were they really representing the will of of all these people, or just a narrow band of of, of interest that they might have had themselves? Let me start from the end of your comment and go backwards. So. One of my coworkers at the museum wanted us to sell t-shirts in our shop with a woman when we were observing the 150th anniversary of the treaty in 2005. She wanted us to sell t-shirts that had an Indian woman standing in front of the lodge with her hand on her hip saying, you signed what? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's part, of your, part of your question is whose will was represented. Um, Men were the, at the time, men were the, were the official spokespersons of the tribe. Women did not t typically public make oration, publicly make oration. Um, we had women who were leaders and men who were leaders, but public oration was usually the domain of men. Um, the people who served the role of camp crier were usually men. Um, the people who negotiated on behalf of our people with others were typically men. It was rare that a woman would be put in that position. Um, we had an equal division of labor. Women had property rights. Women could get divorced, unlike women in the East who were chattel at the time. Um, but we were not spokespersons. So at the Treaty Council, for, on behalf of the Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla, there are 36 X's on the Treaty Council uh, document. I think in the Nez Perce document there are 54, and I don't remember how many there are on the Yakima Treaty. Um, but they were all signed between June 9th and June 11th of 1855. Now, there's a couple of kinds of duress and stress that are present at the Treaty Council. One I'll give attention to is recorded by Isaac Stevens, the governor of the Washington Territory, when he transmits all the documents of the Treaty Council, sort of the official proceeding record, to Commissioner Manny Penny in Washington at the conclusion of the camp for the treaty. And he suggests in this letter, or he states in this letter, that had we not succeeded in treaty making at the end of this protracted, because it was two and a half weeks, protracted negotiation, there would have surely been bloodshed. And he says that because those, uh, during the two and a half, almost three weeks that people are camped there, and there's thousands of Indians camped there and a very small detachment of military with these treaty commissioners. So they're vastly outnumbered. What they know through their reconnaissance and through communicating with friendly Christian Cayuses and Nez Perces is that the Cayuse were proposing war outside of the council. The Cayuse were going to the Nez Perce and proposing war. And because the Nez Perce refused to ally themselves with the Cayuse, we did not go to war because the proposal was, let's take back our country. We don't have to sign this. We don't have to agree to a subset of our homeland. But because the more numerous Nez Perce would, would, had refused, they had promised Lewis and Clark they would never make war on the United States and refused to comply with our invitation to go to war, we ended up agreeing to the treaty on June 9, uh, 1855. Now, when I say under duress, uh, if you read the Treaty Council even though we were vastly outnumbering the white people who were there. What the commissioners are saying to us, and largely it's Stevens, at the 11th hour when we're refusing to sign the document, Joel Palmer steps up and makes a last, an 11th hour last ditch effort to offer us something we're more interested in than's been offered to us thus far. Um, and we accept that proposal eventually. But what we're being told is we cannot protect you from bad white men who are coming. They are as numerous as the grass, and they will roll over you. And we cannot help you if you don't mark out a place for yourselves now and claim a place for yourselves now. We can't tell you what will happen. Gold has been discovered. We can't control people who come for gold. That's the gist of the message we're being given. So if you want to protect your people and your way of life, make a decision today. We can't wait and come back and talk to you next month. We can't wait and talk to you next year. You don't have time to deliberate amongst yourself. Make a decision today. 
And that's what I mean by duress. There's another angle to this uh, that you won't uh, find shocking because it happens today all the time. One of the things that Palmer and Stevens remind not only at Walla Walla, but later at other treaties like the Wasco Treaty in middle, so-called Middle Oregon uh, along the Columbia is we might want to do what you're suggesting, but it will never pass muster in Washington. The president won't sign this. The great father in Washington won't allow it. And as Bobby said, there was a frequent, um, not, it wasn't a bluff really, but a frequent urgency to wrap this up. And they forced, in many of these treaty councils, in the second day or the third day, tomorrow, you're going to sign. Tomorrow, we will finish this, and we'll all be happy. But back to the question about whether or not they're representing all of the people, one of the things that happens, P.O.P.O. Mox Mox is a good example of this, but there are also um, chiefs at uh, the Wasco Treaty that do this on the second day or the third day. They'll come back and say, General Palmer, you said yesterday, da 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 Why are you saying today, da 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 I know your heart is good, he told Palmer, but you must be straight. So one of the problems here is when we say representation, we think about our own representation. But this representation is a representation that goes way beyond an assignment of even responsibility. These, uh, I don't want to say I'm contested statements, but these challenges of a sort are really spoken from the heart of the people through the messenger, the chief who is making the point, speaking to the most powerful person in the room, who is the chief negotiator from the United States government, even though they were outnumbered. The definitive statements by Palmer and Stevens and other treaty negotiators and peace commissioners in all of these documents and the many treaties, there were nine in Oregon, are, um, they're presumptuous, but they're, um, they're almost um, climatic in their force. You must. It's doomsday if you don't. You'll all be gone. These were images that were rejected. So the representation, it's a good question, but you can see that it's a very di difficult um, image to sketch out what that representation meant. So there were, there were tribes that were less well represented simply because of the time of the meeting and who, who did not come to the meetings. Um, but we know that we had advocates and spokespersons um, very strong on behalf of the Cayuse and the Walla Walla. Less so for the Umatilla, the people identified as Umatilla as a culture group. Um, <coughs> and that's in part because the treaty commissioners and their representatives who came out to gather the people for those councils didn't actually know linguistically how far down river we were related or how far up river we were related and sort of where those linguistic breaks were. So the people that we call Umatilla are related to the people from Wayam, 
or Salilo and John Day. And so those are a linguistic group and they speak a similar language, dialect but different from the people on the north side of the Columbia River who are considered uh, Wishcom and they're different from the Kicht or Chinookan speakers. And so because they didn't know all of that cultural information, they tended to split and divide families and groups inappropriately and band together people who were not necessarily appropriately banded together. The Cayuse had been an isolate and were an insular culture, heavily intermarried with the Nez Perce, but not as, Umatilla and Walla Walla were more alike than Cayuse was to either of them. So there, the treaty making process uh, confederated peoples it should maybe not have. Um, we live and grow together now, um, but those historic relationships made from the treaty process sometimes were a little bit less natural. So that's a, another angle of that representation issue. One more question. We're, prior to uh, obtaining horses, was there as much intermixing as I've heard you describe? I'm assuming getting horses made uh, travel a lot easier. Well, horses did one, you could go faster, further, and carry more um, with horses. The, we went as far on foot as we did on horseback, so we went to Buffalo on foot um, before horses <clears throat> in what's now the Yellowstone area. We came to Celilo from upriver, but we also People tend to forget because we became, the Cayuse especially became such a great horse culture, that we were watercraft people. That what brings tribes together who are from the Columbia River is the river system. And so at every confluence, there are gathering places and meeting places. Um, at every Camas Prairie, it's a gathering place and a meeting place. So the seasonal round provided for those places to gather by great numbers. And we gathered at great numbers at Celilo long before we had horses. It was one of the six or seven great trade centers in the North American continent long before we had horses. Um, I think the thing that probably is most important sort of to recognize about horses is that there were, the, the original horse, Eohippus, originated from this continent. Um, we have excavated right outside where our museum stands today, um, a myohippus bone, which is the middle horse, 10 to 15 million years ago. <clears throat> there are petroglyphs of horses that represent the likenesses of horses before the modern horse. So there's some question marks about that horse history um, that we don't have full accounts for. We can't inform. But I would say to you, um, it was a very short period of time before we domesticated and selectively bred horses in great quantities, and then became masters at fleecing other in the bedding, others in the bedding of horse races. So it was a very short period of time we got good at that. Thank you both so much. Thank you all for being here. Yes, they're amazing. Mm -hmm. And there's event calendars and handouts on the um, desk at the back of the room. Please join us for more programs and have a good evening. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, it's good to see you too. Sorry.